Mike, thanks for sitting down with me today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for asking and having me. Mike, I understand uh, one of your areas of expertise is biofortification. This is true. We've been talking more and more about it. Can you explain a little bit about the role that biofortification plays in feeding the world? So let me at first um, explain in my own words what the concept of biofortification actually is. So in theory, it's using genes and alleles to improve the nutritional quality profile of food crops. So to give an, like an example of what we're doing in, in my research lab is we're improving the pro-vitamin A and vitamin E content of maize grain. And I also have projects to improve cassava for pro-vitamin A content. So the big challenge about biofortification is a lot of the food crops that are eaten in the world, such as rice, um, potatoes, maize, and cassava, are a great source of calories, carbohydrates, starch, but they are, have such a low concentration of um, important nutritional compounds, such as, say, provitamin A, vitamin E, zinc, and iron, and iodine, or other B vitamin complexes. So I think now people are realizing that calories is obviously very important, but we need to be thinking more about malnutrition, and that is improving the nutritional content because um, there's this concept called hidden hunger, whereas you may be receiving the calories, but you're not getting in other nutritional value that you actually need. So it, I, I think it's becoming um, um, highlighted a lot more in breeding programs as, as we try to feed this growing world's population, where in the past, at first it was just breeding for, for yield. Now we're beginning to be more mindful of also breeding for quality traits as well at the same time. What trends do we see in biofortification, or focal points maybe is another way to ask So. I would say what I think most people will have heard of is probably golden rice. And golden rice is very much a hot button topic in a sense. It's transgenic and it really hasn't had an opportunity to impact the world's population that is at risk and who can benefit greatly from it. It just hasn't had the opportunity. So when, when we think about biofortification and what it can actually offer, when you think about at-risk populations, you should be thinking about, okay, what certain vitamins or other nutritional components are they not getting in their actual diet? And then that should maybe be a focus of breeding programs in that area of the world. But ideally, we don't just want a population to subsist entirely on, say, cassava or maize or rice. We need a diversity of their actual diet. So then you can say, uh, bringing in fruits and vegetables, and such as like um, obviously carrots, great source of pro vitamin A, uh, kale, as, as as my shirt would say. Um, so those, those are some things that, that we should be keeping in mind is, yes, we, we should be improving the nutritional value of our, you know, key food crops, but at the main, um, you know, we should also be diversifying the foods that we eat. Problems is, such as in countries of um, sub-Saharan Africa, they may not have the financial resources to maybe purchase meat, fish, and other fruits and vegetables, or perhaps they won't have even access to it. Right. right. Well, and, and speaking of that, you're working with a plant that I, I will be the first to admit I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Guayuli. 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 I'm not familiar with it at all. And why is that plant so important? For and, and, and where are you taking it? So this is just going to be totally different, unrelated to biofortification, all because guayuli is used for rubber and latex, okay. and is a desert shrub 
growing in the southwest U.S. And a lot of people may not realize this, rubber is essential to our economy of our entire world, okay? And right now, there are a lot of clonally propagated rubber trees in Southeast Asia that are at risk from like blights, and they don't have the resistance to prevent from being completely wiped out. So can you think of a world that we live in now without rubber? I cannot either. So this is a way to produce a sustainable domestic source of rubber and latex in the US. And this is essentially also a particular plant species that's almost maybe one or two generations removed from being a wild species. And we're creating a lot of the genomics tools and resources now so that people can be breeding it now. So there's tire companies such as Bridgestone and Cooper Tires that are beginning to invest heavily in this plant because they see the future as if they want to have, be able to provide for their own products, i.e. tires for like cars and trucks, they have to have a renewable source. And so this is an all alternative to trees that are say growing in Asia. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. Interesting. Well, and to change gears one more time, yep. um, as the chair of the USDA's uh, Plant Breeding Coordinating Committee, yep. why do you think it's important for government officials and policymakers to understand what, what plant breeders are working on and then also the, the, the techniques and the technology that they're using to do that? Why is that so important? So I've, I've been, I, I would say, privileged to you know, these past few years and now chair and then after this meeting I'll be the past chair of the Plan Breeding Coordinating Committee. And it was, I think, a very unique opportunity for me to provide service to the greater plan breeding community in the U.S. with a focus on land grant universities in the U.S. So it's very much focused on the public side. And even though I can't, you know, pre-present a case to Congress because I can't lobby, okay? But I can answer any questions that come from, say, um, other groups in the federal government, okay? And this provides us uh, a vehicle for, for all of us plant breeders to, you know, share and communicate to perhaps people that are the policy makers and so that they can appreciate the impact that plant breeding is having on the U.S. in terms of providing food and nutritional security and also helping us, in a sense, prepare ourselves as a country and as a world in the face of, of climate change. And when you think about climate change, you can think of uh, droughts, heat, and flooding and um, fastly evolving pathogens as well. These are things that are ongoing and are always going to be a problem. Like plant breeders will always have a job, basically. And I just don't think there is a good appreciation, even in the general public or even in the um, people that create the policies, in that this is such a critical component of the U.S. and being able to increase the capacity for plant breeding in the U.S. is not only important for the security of the U.S., but for the in entire world. Big tasks. Plant breeders have a lot of weight on, on their shoulders, but at the same time, um, Thankfully, we, we have our in, entire careers. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. So maybe I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about, uh, about some of the new breeding technologies that, that are being used today, and, and maybe a little bit around what's at stake if, if they become as regulated as GMOs, and what's your recommendation to those that are reviewing these techniques um, to determine how they should be handled? Yeah, that's definitely a tough loaded question. So when we think about a technology such as CRISPR-Cas9 and the type of impact that that can have on public plant breeding is that can offer public plant breeders an opportunity to basically do gene therapy in their breeding programs 
and be able to quickly, or I should, should say uh, in a quicker fashion, bring a product to a consumer's table a lot more rapid and using a more precise technology than has been ever been performed before in the past 20 plus years. Now, with any new technology, there is always going to be risks. So what I would ask is for anyone that's evaluating this technology is to carefully and objectively evaluate the science. But at the same time, I think one of the major failings that we've had with transgenics is in the early, say, um, 20 plus years, maybe when uh, transgenics were just being re released, is we didn't really involve the public and educate them and bring them in as being part of the process. That's where we failed in maybe the late 80s and the early 90s. And I am at fear that something like that could happen again for such as such a potentially game-changing technology such as CRISPR-Cas9. And so if the public isn't part of this process, then I am really frightened that we may fail as plant scientists, but as scientists in general. Agreed. Agreed. Well said. Well said. Um, Mike, you've received a number of awards. It's clear that you're a leader within the plant breeding sector. Thank you. What advice would you have for students as they get ready for a career in plant breeding, or, or maybe even more importantly, for those people even considering a career in plant breeding? Yeah, so that's, that's a really tough question, um, and, and it causes me to pause and kind of reflect on my, I guess, past, um, past years in, in science. But I think probably one of the most critical pieces of advice I can give to someone is being able to sit down and pause and to ask important biological questions. It really begins with the question. And you can, you know, pressure test that question, look at that question from every angle, and then that is, in a sense, like the crux of your research going forward. And, you know, is that a testable hypothesis? Do I need to revise that hypothesis as I go forward? And then you need to also be thinking about the potential impact of that important biological question that you are asking, not only in the context of your crop that you're doing this in, but in the context of crops or plants in general. And that, I, I think, is obviously very critical because, you know, like the first thing is obviously we want to do high quality research. You know, we can't obviously publish in like the top journals, but as, you know, just as long as it's high quality, but I think the key though is it all begins with the question that's being asked. And then at the same time, I think you can ask yourself, is this an impactful question? What type of impact will this have in in science if I carry out this research project? Right, right. You're involved in a number of projects. You got a lot of things going on. Yeah. What what gets you the most excited now? What gets you out of bed in the morning? That that is is a good question. I think one one thing I maybe haven't learned early on, and um, I guess. I, I guess I'm, I'm not entirely like an early career scientist as I once was, but um, I think I haven't said no a lot of times, right? Because you know, science is just so fun, and you just want to ask like these these questions, and you want to have new challenges and new projects and new colleagues, and you know that's that's always fun. But when I think about my passion and what like gets me out of bed, is really feeding the world highly nutritious food. And that's where I think plant breeders can have a tremendous amount of impact on humanity. And that is where my passion lies. Nice. Well said, Mike. Thank you. Thanks very much for sitting down with me. I appreciate Pleasure. it a lot. Pleasure. Pleasure.